All right, well, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mitch Connors, and I'm a software engineer with Google. And there I work on Istio and the Anthos Service Mesh, focusing on usability, making sure that our user experience is up to par. Uh, I'm really happy to introduce this panel today, where we're going to be talking about war stories from inside the development of various service meshes that you've heard about throughout the day. And I'll go ahead and ask my panelists to introduce themselves and share one thing that is unique about their service mesh. Um, I'll go ahead first. Uh, my name is Irina Shustava. I'm an engineer on the console service mesh. Um, and something that's unique about the console service mesh is that um, it's kind of like a multi-platform service mesh. So you can maybe call it platform agnostic uh, service mesh that you can pretty much run anywhere. Hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Phil Gibson. I'm a senior PM. Oh, you got me. Hello, my name is Phil Gibson. I'm a senior PM at Microsoft. Um, uh, basically, uh, PM a lot of our security projects, uh, open surface mesh being one. And uh, I guess what's unique about us is I think we are the youngest in the game, possibly. Hey everyone, I'm William Morgan. I'm the CEO of Buoyant, which makes Linkerd. Um, and what's unique about Linkerd, I guess there's a lot, but you know, one thing that comes to mind is we might be the only service mesh that does not use Envoy. Thanks. And well, I've already introduced myself. Uh, what I think is my favorite thing about Istio, I don't know how unique it is, but I just love our community. Uh, we've had 315 companies contribute just in the last year, and 11 of them are involved in leading the project as a whole. So uh, at conferences like this or any part of the world I go to, there's almost certainly going to be a coworker nearby that I can go and grab lunch with, which is just uh, a really cool feeling to have. All right, so first question for the panelists, and by the way, I'm, I'm a panelist and I'm gonna be moderating because I couldn't find anybody else to. So um, our, our first question for the panelists is, uh, why should you use a service mesh? We've heard a lot about that today, but also why shouldn't you use a service mesh? Who wants to take it? Uh, All you? Okay, yeah. Uh, I think um, what we're seeing with the service mesh is it's, it's becoming more of like a new platform, right? So when we say utilizing it, uh, being able to not have to kind of keep forward legacy APIs when you talk about circuit breaking, uh, rate limiting, et cetera, it, it's becoming its own platform. And uh, I know with OSM, I mean, we're seeing, uh, we're branching out in this ecosystem, doing a lot of uh, integrations into OPA and, and, and other products. So. Uh, I think that's a good reason to use it. Uh, the flip side of it, what, can, can you, what's the question again? I want to make sure. I'm it was, what are reasons maybe not to use a service mesh? Uh, yeah, I think um, there's, there's some misunderstandings about what a service mesh actually um, resolves for you or, or, or does for you. Uh, I think um, most of my communication with customers is about like, network policy stuff, you know, they like it. They're kind of thinking old school VLANing and, and I say, no, that's, we're a little above the stack where, where you're at. So uh, just just make sure like you're, you're doing your homework and you're understanding kind of what, what the service message is gonna provide for you. Yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, so for me, you know, I think there is I think there's exactly one reason when you should use a service mesh and every other reason is a reason not to use it. And that one reason is if you have a very concrete and specific problem that you are solving. If you are adopting a service mesh because you feel like you need to adopt a service mesh or because you see other people doing it and you want to do it too, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And this is true of any technology, but I think it's especially true of the service mesh, which, you know, is uh, for a variety of reasons is mired in, you know, a, a lot of buzz. Um, so whether that specific problem is something, you know, relating to encryption of data in transit or whether it's reliability or whether it's getting a, you know, a uniform layer of observability, 
almost all of the service mesh projects will provide something along those lines with a lot of differences you know, in, in some of the implementation details, but the value prop is largely the same. But unless you're adopting that technology for a specific problem that you understand, then you're going to end up with a boondoggle. And probably every answer I give for the rest of this uh, <laughs> panel is going to be some variant of that, so I apologize in advance. Um, yeah, I, I kind of agree with everything that's been said uh, already. Um, and I do think like every organization probably has to do their own cost-benefit analysis of um, whether it makes sense for them to run a service mesh. And when it comes to benefits, I feel like uh, there's already been some great talks that covered a lot of that um, already. And, you know, the, the, the benefit is really that you have all, like the networking and the security layer, something that you would typically maybe write into your application, that is kind of automated for you by the service mesh. But it comes at a cost of uh, and complexity of running it and understanding it. Um, and you know, it, essentially it's another layer that's kind of hidden from you. Um, so every organization kind of has to understand, you know, this is a relatively new technology, and so you have to do the cost-benefit analysis of whether it makes sense to you. Um, do you have applications for platforms that it supports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, but yeah, I, I think ultimately it's kind of uh, a trade-off that you would be making at the end of the day. Yeah. I think one of the costs that often gets overlooked when people are coming to adopt a service mesh is it's the same for any software component. As engineers, we're all really excited to get our hands on new technology, but every piece of technology that you add has a cost. Even if it's free and open source, it has a cost in terms of maintenance. And so the reason to not adopt a service mesh that I would say is if, if you don't have an intention of upgrading and keeping up to date with whatever service mesh implementation you choose, um, you wouldn't run a five-year-old Apache server exposed to the internet, right? There's been dozens of CVEs over the years, like there are with any networking appliance, uh, and so it would be completely dangerous. But we do see some users doing that effectively that with their service mesh. It's managing their identity, it's man managing their ingress, and yet they're running, in my case, I'm looking at Istio, and they're running versions of Istio that are in some cases three years old, uh, which just, um, I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> yeah, arguably, the, it's the free and open source technologies that have the highest cost, yeah. you know, especially in terms of long-term maintenance. That's true. All right, next question up. Uh, what's the most surprising use case for a service mesh that you have seen? Answer number three may shock you. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'll start out because, because I, I do have the story that we all talked about a lot. Uh, so the last in-person KubeCon NA, um, the Department of Defense demoed a system where they're running Istio on an F-16. Uh, so one of the things that I, well, I pri I'd say I pride myself or I used to pride myself on is that I run the software that can't kill anyone. Uh, like if it crashes, it's not a car accident or a pacemaker that doesn't work anymore. But apparently that's not entirely the case anymore. Uh, that was definitely a surprising use case. Not sure I quite have my head wrapped around why the F-16 was running Istio, but apparently it was. <laughs> did, did that improve it? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess either way. Yeah, that that was a weird that was a weird one. Even you know from the outside looking in. Uh, I'll say on the Linkerd side, I am often surprised by what people do with it. Um, you know, because my background was very much in the world of uh, we're building an API to serve like you know uh, calls from people's you know cell phones, you know from their apps and stuff, and and that was what I was used to. But you know we've had Linkerd be used to um, uh, for like train switching and stuff, which you know, hopefully that works really well. Um, we've had it used in medical devices, you know, that people rely on. We've had it used. Um, actually, I gave a keynote last time about all the ways it had been used to help combat uh, COVID-19 during the middle of the pandemic. You know, in all sorts of interesting ways. So it's continually surprising to me, I guess, uh, and and kind of gratifying too, because 
people are bringing it into new situations and solving new problems that I wasn't even aware of. One of the few joys in open source. <laughs> Yeah, I think mine's probably a little boring, but um, I think mine touches on some of the integration. So uh, we were working with a customer, and I guess what Service Mesh kind of, you, you get to this crossroad between the ops and, and the devs, right? And uh, who actually controls policy. So uh, this, this one particular customer actually wanted to use the OPA integration because they said, hey, they, they don't trust the developers. <laughs> so, so they actually had a policy in OPA to just ensure that uh, you know the HTTP payloads and, and ever, you know, all of that was was in line, right? So, I just thought that was that was interesting that um, you know someone was watching the other group and back and forth, you know. The Malicious deny. developers, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> right, yeah, you know. Yeah. But it's a good, yeah, it's a good use case. I mean, <laughs> it, it just speaks to the added granularity that you can do with these technologies. I now. think we can all agree developers are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the console side, I think um, the, the one kind of use case that was surprising to me, um, and I'm going to mention at a risk of adding another buzzword to the mix, um, oh. <laughs> is that um, one of the blockchain companies wanted to, to use a service mesh. And I uh, did not think that this was possible, but uh, I thought it was an interesting use case. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, what challenges do you see most commonly from people who are trying to ado adopt service mesh? Um, go ahead. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, I think we can all agree that a service mesh is kind of like the, the canary of where you're at on your maturity journey with the Kubernetes, you know. Um, but I think the biggest thing we see is um, people always want to scream at latency uh, when a service mesh gets turned on. And then you kind of ask them, well, what, what was it before? And they don't typically have those metrics prior. So uh, what I would say is, hey, if you're on this journey, just, just do your homework, start you know, getting the math, start you know, getting the metrics, and then uh, just kind of crawl, walk, run type of approach, right? Just start to slowly enable things and, and, and get used to, to how it works and, and see what the impact is in your environment. I don't know what it was before, but it's definitely worse now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the challenges that we're seeing is um, related to kind of different deployment architectures and how different organizations, depending on their size, um, like how many Kubernetes clusters they have, and some organizations end up having like quite a quite a few clusters and. If you are in the situation, then running a service mesh control plane in each of the clusters could be quite a bit of operational overhead. Um, and what we're finding from, from those users is that they kind of want to have some notion of multi-tenancy where they would have kind of a shared control plane, whether that's deployed somewhere else or maybe you're running it as a cloud service or what have you. Um, and, and then like having those multiple Kubernetes clusters more, mostly just having the data plane. Um, and like kind of supporting these organizations in, in these deployment models um, is, is been kind of a challenge, uh, an ongoing challenge because it keeps changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I have kind of a long answer to this, which is, well, you know, like I've been doing service mesh stuff since like 2015, I think, if you trace it back. So I've been on panels like this for over five years, basically answering the same question, you know, what's the biggest challenge to service mesh adoption? And my answer, what's astounding is that my answer continues to be the same year after year, which is that there's so much hype and there's so much noise and there's so much confusion that I think as someone who wants to adopt the service mesh and wants to do the right thing, like, it's really, really hard to, to know what you should do. And I don't know what it is about the service mesh, but it just attracts that type of thing. I mean, look at this conference, right? Can you be in this room for more than 30 seconds without smelling brimstone? 
stop smelling the, the pungent aromas of vendor marketing? Where, where are the end user talks in this conference? It's like all vendor talks. There's three end user talks. Every other talk is from someone who wants to sell you a service mesh. And that is a sign of a sick technology. That's an unhealthy relationship. That's a junk food relationship. That's the, that's the candy bar that you see, you know, you see the commercial and you're like, oh, that looks so good. And you taste it and it tastes great for about 30 seconds. And then you're left with empty calories and a sugar hangover. And like two years later, you're still trying to get the service mesh to work and it never lives up to its promises. And not only have you not kept your promises to your team, you've let them down. You've left things in a worse place because you're boondoggled, you're saddled with this technology that you can't adopt. That's, that's a real tragedy because it doesn't have to be that way. There is a path to salvation. There is a path. It is a difficult path. It's one that is not for the uh, faint of heart or the weak of spirit. <laughs> But it is a path, and that path is understanding very concretely the problem that you were trying to solve, and then using that as a site to cut through the waves of vendor marketing until you understand exactly what you're trying to accomplish and exactly what the options are for accomplishing it. We might need to update your LinkedIn profile, Service Mesh Profit, something along those lines. We can work on it later. It just it spoke through me. The spirit of the service mesh spoke through me. You know, I mentioned seeing a lot of users kind of install and forget uh, in Istio and, and how concerning that is. And we started asking users about a year ago why that was. And what we found was that upgrading is, is a really hard thing in a service mesh. You know, you know, the best thing about a service mesh is now you have a proxy that's running everywhere. And the worst thing about a service mesh is now you have a proxy that's exactly. running everywhere. Exactly. And it, you've got to upgrade it. You've got to patch it when there's CVEs, when there's a new version. You've got a control plane that you've got to take care of. Uh, and so the whole last year in our project, we've really had a renewed focus on sort of day two operations and what it costs to maintain an Istio installation. One of the biggest things uh, that has changed, I mean, we've worked on making it easier, but we've also worked on making it so you don't have to do it as often. Uh, so that now users, instead of having to upgrade quarterly, they can upgrade every six months. And it's too soon to say, but we're hoping that that will encourage users and take one of those big pain points of owning a service mesh and, and make it a little bit less painful for our users. Yeah. All right. What's the, uh, the biggest ongoing debate in your service mesh project? Me? You, you want me to go again? <laughs> well, Didn't we, learn the first time. <laughs> we all live in perfect harmony on Team Linkerd, so we basically, you know, we just ring the gong and we all just write the code and there's no arguments. No, I think for us, the, uh, we have a continual challenge, which is we're trying to make Linkerd really, really simple. And we're also trying to make it do a lot of stuff. And those two things are kind of at odds. And, you know, there's... It's not, a, uh, it's not a complete dichotomy. There's ways of introducing features, you know, which add a lot of complexity, and there's ways of introducing features which add a small amount of complexity. Um, and there's different types of complexity. You know, there's operational complexity versus configuration complexity versus maintenance complexity, and all those things kind of go into a big complicated decision matrix. Yeah. So I'd say as a whole, that our biggest challenge, you know, it's, it, it is how do we balance building the set of features that are gonna actually move the needle for someone, um, but not saddling them with something that's, that's really complex. And you know, even something like, that just manifests in so many different ways, even something like WASM you know, has been a really interesting, <laughs> it's been a really interesting uh, discussion internally. So we don't have WASM support, we've held off on it so far, not because WASM sucks, I mean, WASM's awesome, but our, we, had, you know, we had these particular experiences with Linkerd 1.x back in the olden days, built on the JVM, Right, like which you would never want to do, you never build a service mesh that way. But the one thing that the JVM gave us was this plugin architecture where you could load these, you know, runtime plugins, and you know, it had this nice memory model, and it was clear how everything worked. And you know, and, and what we saw was a lot of people shot themselves in the foot in like really severe ways because you'd introduce something into every request path that was doing something, you know, and most of the time it would work, and then every thousand requests it would like, you know, delay for 200 milliseconds or, or whatever. And so that experience has made us a little gun shy of, of you know, complete data plane plugability. On the other hand, there's, there were a lot of good use cases for that. So how do we balance that? 
I don't know. I would say that as a as a whole, that's probably Linkerd's yeah. uh, biggest internal deba mm -hmm. debate. Yeah, I, I would plus one it easy. I mean, you know, there's so much gravity coming from a lot of these new projects like WASM, EBPF, and uh, people want to see it in action, and um, it's 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 not easy. Right? You gotta, and there's buzz, and there's like, right, yeah, and, yeah. You know, so you gotta, cool. you gotta like, manage all this stuff. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I think that you know, from a development perspective, yeah, it's really kind of weighing all the the technologies and then trying to figure out, hey. Like we said, is this a technology that we can attach ourselves to, and, and that's going to be durable and, and really be, you know, something valuable for, for the end user to, to use? Yeah, and the point about the end user is a great one because those are the poor bastards who are going to have yeah. to, you know, <laughs> deal with this in the long run. It's not us. We ship CDs. Like we cut a new release of Linkerd on Friday, and then we go home. Like, go ahead, run it. Let us know how it is. You know, that's a very, very different relationship yeah. that we have to our software from what the user has to our software, because the user actually has to operate it. Well, it's different now, because we actually run Linkerd these days, but for a long time, we didn't run it at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, having that sense of empathy for the end user, right. that is critical to making any of these decisions, because if you don't have that, you're just, you're making a problem for them. You're making a big mess. Yep. Yeah, I definitely agree with, with that. and. Um, Maybe something that um, is unique about uh, console service mesh is that um, it also runs its own data store on Kubernetes. Um, and that comes with its own kind of challenges that we're constantly thinking on how to improve because that obviously comes with, again, like the operational overhead and how do you do upgrades um, and so on. And the ongoing debate, uh, I want to say on our team is, what is the best way of, uh, you know, making it easier for the user, yeah. and not making it so hard to, uh, you know, worry about that data that you're running in every cluster? Yeah, so we we care about the user. I think that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, you know, there's a thing about users too. I internal to Istio, we've got this, you know, Kubernetes API system using oh, yeah. their storage, which has an amazing system for version management and maturity of your APIs. But what we learned is once enough of your users have adopted an API, it does not matter what you called it. We could call it alpha, don't use, not ready for production slash virtual service. But if 10,000 users adopt it, it's not changing. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to change it. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter how much pressure. So there, there's constantly, you know, we'll look at things in the project and say, oh, in hindsight, we could do that a lot better. But uh, we could also break a lot of users by changing it. So sort of balancing the need to improve and, and learn from our mistakes, as well as the need for users to have stability in the project is a constant tension. All right, well, let, let's talk about the war stories of the future. We've talked a little bit about what's going on in our projects over the last few years. Uh, what are the war stories you imagine we'll be talking about at Service MeshCon 2026? Oh, man, they're still doing it then? Well, you, you guys signed up. We, you all have to return. We're going to do a, a SQL panel. I thought we were going to EOL this Ooh. thing. <laughs> I feel like um, we kind of talked a little bit about that, um, but um, I feel like a while ago there was a conversation about like running multiple service meshes and how like this is something that users are going to want. Um, and now nowadays, I don't think it's it's as active of a topic, but I'm wondering or I'm hypothesizing that this is maybe something that will come back. Uh, once the service mesh becomes more mature and people will end up in situations where they're running um, Istio, Linkerd, OSM, and console in one, uh, in one organization. Um, and I'm curious how, like, uh, what are the solutions that are going to, you know, emerge to solve that problem? Oh, thank you. <laughs> ah, the future. Um... <laughs> I don't know, I, I might get a little controversial here. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, again, with end user empathy, right? Um, you know, I, I see a growing concern from the community about some of this functionality just being normal primitives in, inside Kubernetes, right? Um, so that, that's 
probably a, a really, really long debate and with, with SIG groups, and et cetera. But, um, you know, I can see a, a you know, crossroad where those conversations start to get very, very serious, you know. Thanks. And we, we had in one of our uh, kind of pre-panel discussions, we had a really we had a really good conversation about plumbing and how you know if you think about your house or your apartment, you know basically the plumbing just works. And you know if it doesn't, then like it's terrible. And you call a plumber, and the plumber comes in and does something. And for the most part, you're not really an expert in plumbing. You know that it's there. <laughs> you get the benefits of it. You know, like you imagine there's pipes and stuff somewhere in there. Um, but you're not developing any expertise in, in plumbing. And so I think the way, what I liked about that is kind of, I feel like whatever the war stories are about the service mesh in the future, hopefully they're not the same stories that we have now. And hopefully, you know, the service mesh has moved to the level of plumbing. So it's, you know, there are service mesh experts out there, but there are many, many more service mesh users out there who are not experts. And today you kind of have to be an expert, you know, for, to, to operate it. But that really, that shouldn't be the case, right? You, you should, that's not really, unless you're working at a company like Buoyant, being an expert in the service mesh, it's not really your job description. That's just like an unnecessary, it's an unfortunate side effect of the fact that like service mesh is kind of complicated right now. So a lot of what we uh, have been trying to do with Linkerd and also on the Buoyant side is to, can, can, we, can we make this so it really is like plumbing? And so you get the benefits, but you're not paying the, you know, you're not paying the price. And there's still plumbers in the world and like there's still poop, I guess, that like goes through the tubes, you know, that's the traffic and gets encrypted and, and whatever else. But you're not really thinking about that for the most part. And so, you know, I don't, I don't really know what those war stories will look like. I hope they'll be talking about higher level abstractions. I hope they'll be talking about like, you know, oh, po you know, policies and how we got these like, you know, server policies that conflicted with each other. And, you know, therefore the two teams got really angry at each other because their namespaces couldn't talk to, or something. But like, hopefully it's not talking about like the specifics of, you know, our, our proxy implementation or, or whatever. Like that stuff should all fade. If we've done our jobs right as service mesh creators, that should all fade down into the, the, the infrastructure. William, I've heard you use the plumbing analogy a few times. I think actually I heard it last time we were at Service Mesh Con here in person in 2019. I have a lot of plumbing issues in my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, so how do you think we've done so far? Like as an industry, over it's been it's been a few years. How are we doing? You know, I think we're getting there, but I I still feel like you know, even for my own beautiful, perfect Service Mesh Linkerd, the best <laughs> one, like it's still really hard to operate. It's unnecessarily hard. You know, and it'll work fine for long periods of time, and then you have to do an upgrade. And like, you know, then you got to load a lot of stuff into your brain to do that upgrade. So, okay, well, can we make upgrades like totally seamless and transparent? Can we write an operator that does it for you? That's all stuff that we're, you know, that, that, that we're starting to build out. I would like to get to the point, and I think we can get to that point, but we're still a ways away from that. And so, at least in my little survey, um, you know, I'm not happy with the state of, of Linkerd today because I think it is still too hard to run and the people who are really successful who have like these amazing talks. We've got a great talk tomorrow uh, from Intain Australia about how they 10X their throughput using Linkerd, it's awesome, but they are service mesh experts and they had to learn a lot about Linkerd to do that. And I'd like to have those same stories happen without anyone really understanding the internals of Linkerd, um, you know, other than like, I guess, the Linkerd experts who, I don't know, who are the plumbers in this analogy. I'm curious, Irina and Brian, what, what do you guys think of the plumbing analogy? Is that where, where you guys see us heading, kind of where your projects are going? And, and do you see any initiatives that you guys are currently working glorious, on? That would get us there? Glorious plumbing. <laughs> what, could, what more could we ask for? <laughs> I just bought a house so I could really relate right. to see? the plumbing analogy. We're on the same wavelength. <laughs> um, but I, I do like, really like this analogy because it really makes me think of like what would it be uh, what would it look like for me to just call a plumber when it comes to like a service mesh? Because right now it feels like you, you do need to build that expertise in whether um, you know, this is something that you do internally within your organization. I think that probably is something that happens most of the time. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering like how will this evolve and whether like people will decide to kind of offload that knowledge to maybe something like a vendor or a cloud service um, or, you know, 
will they decide to still like build that expertise internally? And then on the other end, like what can we as like service mesh, uh, uh, you know, uh, producers uh, do to make it easier? And is it really automatable, or is this a problem that can never be truly automated? Um, one thing that, that kind of going back to your question, Mitch, uh, that we're doing on the console side is um, trying to make it easier for people to like diagnose problems, you know, because right now it's sort of like, imagine if you had a plumbing emergency, but there were no plumbers to call <laughs> and you would have to figure, figure it all out on, on your own. That's how it feels like right now. And what we're trying to do is build tools to help people kind of diagnose and uh, fix those faster. I think that's a really good point because actually plumbing kind of sucks, right? Like you have no idea what's happening in your house. Water's flowing around. You have no visibility into it. There's all sorts of things that you know we can improve plumbing too. So maybe that's the next uh, next startup. Yeah, I spent six thousand dollars on a plumbing leak over the summer that that just drained into my crawl space. Right. I would have loved Grafana nice. for right. my plumbing. Like that right. would have been really really useful. Right. So I, I guess as I think about kind of the plumbing model for Istio and our projects, one of the things that we've all talked a little bit about is Kubernetes APIs. You know, when, when you move into an apartment, you expect that it has plumbing, but you don't really ask who the manufacturer was, like whether they used Plex connectors or copper pipes, or I mean, maybe you ask about lead if it's really old, but for the most part, you don't care. Uh, as it has the same interface, you use it the same way. I think the way that, that the industry is going, service meshes can be the same way. You don't necessarily need to think too carefully about whether it's Istio or Linkerd or Console or OSM or Kong or I'm gonna miss some, I can't name all of them under the hood. You're simply able to use like the Kubernetes gateway APIs and whatever the folks at Kubernetes networking come up with yet next to use the service mesh. You use it and you move on and, and stop thinking about the underlying implementation. How do you think yeah. this will be possible in the future? Like, well, I think I think we get a hint of it today in the gateway APIs, right? They're they're at v1 alpha two, I think, in Kubernetes one twenty two, um, and so they're they're starting to take shape. I think the shape they're in now is probably mostly what they're going to look like as they move forward. But there's a lot more to be done, right? There's a lot more to a service mesh than just gateways and ingress, and so uh, I, I haven't talked to the folks in Kube networking recently to know. What, what is this, the next API they're going to tackle and bring new ones? But I, I like what they've done so far, and I'm excited to see what happens next. All right, well, I think that's all the questions I have. Did any of you have anything to add in before we go to questions from the audience? All right. I'm good. I think we had someone promising to read questions off the internet, if there were any. And yeah, uh, go ahead here on, on my right. And if you could speak up, I'm hard of hearing. I will. Okay, so the question is, I'm gonna rephrase a little bit, but uh, what sort of redundancies exist in the service mesh world to make sure that your service mesh doesn't go down? How do you run more than one for high availability in your projects? Well, I think that there's kind of two parts to it. Uh, one is, I, I'm not sure if you're asking about the control plane or the data plane. Um, in the data plane. Yeah, so I feel like in the data plane, because you're running um, your proxy as a sidecar with your application, so you will have as many proxies as your application instances. And it, I think that will that basically provides the high availability that you're looking for. I think, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's really easy to do that at runtime in a stable state within your service mesh because you're hopefully running your application already in a high, highly available configuration. You've hopefully got horizontal pod autoscalers all configured for it to respond to demand. And so your service mesh data plane will respond to demand as well. Where it gets a little bit more complicated, in my opinion, is during an upgrade. Uh, 
because all of a sudden you have something that's infrastructure and plumbing for your entire thing and you're gonna, you know, you don't go to an apartment and rip the plumbing out and put it in while the water is running one day, but we do that with service mesh. And so it's a little bit more complicated. We've tried to use revisions to allow you to sort of flip the, the switch as you see fit on each service and then flip it back if you want. But it, it's still not what I would describe as a completely highly available system for upgrading the data plane. Yeah. The sidecar is a double-edged sword. <laughs> I mean, it does a lot of extensibility, but um, you know, it's, it's programming IP tables and if that thing goes south, you're in a world of hurt trying to figure out a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I don't think Linkerd <laughs> does anything different here than, than any of the other service meshes. It's, you know, we rely on the same Kubernetes primitives and like it's, you know, replica sets of immutable pods. And so that yep. kind of informs the, the, the solution space there. You know, if we, if Kubernetes changes or if we move off of Kubernetes, then like you've got different, you know, you've got different options. You know, I guess you could write your whole data plane as one big WASM plugin and then just dynamically load it. There you go. You know? Well, it could be the next. It could be the next big wave. But where would the Wasm run? Ooh. It'd be a data plane and a data plane. We could run Linkerd uh, inside of Istio. Cluster. I'm sure there's a, a, a blockchain or something in there. Yeah, there's a blockchain. <laughs> Very nice. I think there was another question. So I'm actually going to ask if one of you can repeat it. My hearing is really bad, and I don't think I could do, repeat that. So I think the question was about upgrades again, right? How to basically have a, a zero downtown experience. Am I summing it up correctly? So, yeah, yeah. Um, more of like, how do you go like, do a rigorous testing? OK, the testing around it, yeah. Uh, sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I would. Probably say everyone's in, in line here. I mean, the development process, I mean, there's various, you know, soak tests that are doing, you know, corner and edge cases, you know, we're, we're probably piling way more workload on than what a usual customer would do. And, and again, if you're soak testing, you're, you're running it for a long time, right? Um, so yeah, we, we, we got a pretty stringent process as far as, you know, when we you know, enable new features and, and take them through the regression testing. Yeah. yeah, I like this question a lot because open source is horrible. <laughs> it's, you know, we, we do so much testing on Linkerd and like as many different iterations as we can yeah. and like, we'll, and we ship out, you know, re, uh, release candidates and we're like, hey everyone, please try these release candidates and like people do and they find issues and we're feeling pretty confident and we'll, you know, then we'll ship a, a release and then like someone will upgrade three weeks later and they're like, well, it doesn't actually work if you're on this special variant of this and this and this. And right, right. you're like, ah, oh, if you had just tested that like, you know, earlier or if we had known about that, like, you know, and now we have to cut a new release and that's annoying because there's all this process and we have to redo all the testing. So it's just, it's a difficult, I mean, I don't think there's a, an easy solution, but it's, but it's difficult. And I think it's particularly difficult for the service mesh because it sits at the intersection of all these complicated things, right? The network is going through it and all of the layer three, layer four, like underlying substrate there. Like if something's weird there, then like that's gonna affect your service mesh. It relies on all this Kubernetes stuff. And like if something's weird there, then that's gonna affect your service mesh. It relies on, you know, it's just this weird, super complicated intersection. So I don't know that we, you know, at least yeah. from my perspective, I don't know that we really have a great answer. I did mention earlier, and this has made actually a nice difference for us, we started running uh, Linkerd ourselves. So we have a, a SaaS product called Buoyant Cloud that's powered by Linkerd and that has really changed our relationship with this product because now, you know, we have a team that is like, 
you know, has to wake up at three in the morning when Linkerd ain't <laughs> working. And like that team is highly incentivized to make sure that like, okay, I'm going to watch this upgrade. I'm going to really make sure I'm going to look, you know, right, right. That's right. <laughs> so we're not just shipping CDs anymore. We actually are, you know, living the whole service owner lifestyle. And that's helped. But even with that, you know, even with that, we run this in one particular environment, you know, and there's a hundred different edge cases that we don't get. And so it's just a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult process. Every release accumulates tests, but right, still right, yeah. stuff goes through. I mean, I, I think the unfortunate truth is like, we, we can't accommodate for every permutation that's out there, right? And then, I mean, I think what William is saying here is, that's why we like to push RCs out. I mean, we, we tell you, hey, this is kind of experimental, et cetera, test it out. And uh, we, we actually do get a lot of feedback from the community. You know, because again, it's it's hard to know every type of configuration that that's out there. You know, so uh, get get your RCs out there early. Get get people beating them up and, and providing feedback <laughs> to, to the GitHub repos. You know, I think at the same time though, like we can't proactively test every conceivable thing that you can do with a network. Yeah. Right, networks have been around for a little while. There's a little bit of surface involved there, and so do, can, testing every combination is just not realistic. What we can commit to, though, is saying we will never break you the same way twice. Uh, if you've experienced an outage on an upgrade in any of these projects, please talk to us, open up a GitHub issue. Uh, it should be added to the SOAP test suite or we, the different yep. projects have different test suites, but it should be added to the automated test system in such a way that we can promise you we won't do it again. Another way of saying that is every time we break your production systems, it's going to be a new and exciting way. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Was that time or was that five minutes? Uh, time? Yeah, I think we have uh, three two minutes. minutes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Please? Some questions over there. And there again, if I could have, have one of you repeat it, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the question was, are there any specific multi-cluster topologies that we see winning out in like the end user space? I can think of one that I'm seeing quite frequently. There's, there's a lot of variation as to why people come to multi-cluster, but one yeah. common thread I'm seeing through very many use cases is they want to have only one cluster to store their configuration in. We've tried out experimentally some models where you have to like blast your config to every cluster that's involved in your mesh or have a replicator system. And by and large, what we found is nobody wants to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of times your config cluster where you're going to be storing things like virtual services, destination routes, gateway configs, are, doesn't actually run any workloads. It's just an empty Kubernetes cluster for housing just your config so that developers can interact with that config without having to worry about uh, having, you know, prod access to your systems. That's just one pattern I've seen. Yeah, I, I, I think I mentioned that also in um, the kind of the panel, one of the panel questions that um, the multi-cluster architecture that we are seeing is uh, when you have kind of like the control plane be shared among the clusters. So you would still want the services in each cluster to connect to each other, but then like maybe you want the control plane to be administered by maybe a separate team, um, or you, yeah, you, maybe you just don't want the developers to have access to, to those configurations. And uh, you know, then you end up with like this more hierarchical structure where you have um, kind of like a control plane running somewhere else, and then your Kubernetes cluster is just mostly having the data plane. Yeah, I think the two main patterns that I've seen is kind of a, a localized uh, spillover, you know, affinity spillover. Uh, and then the other is kind of similar to what was said here is, um, you know, I think most of the enterprise customers are trying to follow the kind of HA patterns of, of the clouds that, it, that they're on. And, and so they want to be able to, to say, hey, if this, this region goes down, can, can we still operate? And so there is kind of this kind of synchronization of, of, of data and config to allow, you know, 
someone on the west coast will still operate something if, if you know the main cluster was on the east coast so uh yeah i i think i mean it's been my experience that a lot of the multi-cluster patterns are, are following kind of uh cloud providers kind of high availability you know processes should we take one more oh we're over time okay. i'm sorry all right well thank you guys for joining me i hope you had as much fun as i did and uh we'll be around so come up to us with questions